I'm not really certain on how they select us. I was working on my bachelor's degree in my state university when I was approached by the team. Project BTAOW33 is what they called it. No cool name like Project X or Project Alpha Time Warp or something along those lines. Just BTAOW33. Whatever that means. They approached me asking if I'd like to take part in an experiment in exchange for my tuition being paid for. I only had a year left in school, but those two semesters were going to cost me $32,000. So of course I said yes. When I asked what the experiment was, they told me it was extremely secretive. I'd be finding out details the day of. Then I could decide if I wanted to back out. About six weeks went by, and I was basically on call to be ready to go whenever they needed me. Finally, I got the call. I live in Atlanta, and the team had the three of us meet up in the parking deck, around 20 minutes outside of the city. Once we were there, we got in one of those short school buses, and they took us out to the northern Georgia mountains. It was about a two hour drive, and we didn't really get much time to get to know each other. We were under strict rules to not reveal information about ourselves or to talk to each other on the bus ride over. The last couple of miles were on a rocky dirt road leading down the mountain. The bus parked in a small, maybe half acre stretch of grass. The grass was freshly mowed and I could tell by the sight and smell. The alcove of grass was encased by large trees from the surrounding forest. All right, a man stood up from his seat at the front of the bus. We're here, I'll brief you all once we get inside the house. As we got off one by one, I could see that in the center of the clearing was a building. It had one very large window on one side, basically encompassing the entire wall. Every other wall was black on the outside, and I could see through the window that the inside was painted white. There was a large, silver, metal ring that surrounded the house. It came about three inches off the freshly mowed grass and was a foot wide, and had lights coming out drilled holes all the way around it. Watch your step, and please do not step on top of this ring, the same man said. Once we get inside, just go ahead and take a seat. We all stepped over the ring and made our way into the house. The house, as the man called it, made up of only of one room. Inside, there were four chairs around a rather large circular table. The chairs, table, and the one lamp were all white. The only thing that wasn't white in the room were the pair of bookshelves against the wall, both empty. After we took our seats, the man introduced himself. All right, welcome, welcome. My name is Dr. Olson, and I'm glad you all decided to take part in this to take part in history. As we all told you, this is extremely sensitive information, and after my explanation of what this experiment consists of, I'll ask you if you want to continue. Understand? What if we don't want to continue? A woman said, about my age with fiery red hair. Then we know this super secret information, right? And you're gonna let us walk out of here? The man gave a smile. He knew this would be asked. Yes. You're free to leave here knowing of what the experiment consists of. However, the university and I are confident in three things. One, you won't want to leave. Two, the university's attorneys are rather powerful and you've already signed the NDAs. And three, no one will believe you if you tell them. Silence filled the room. The redhead slouched back in her chair. A non-verbal will go on then. The experiment, Dr. Olson continued, is time travel. I smiled, but I wasn't sure why. The others seemed to snort a little in amusement. The tensions in the room seemed to release. Now, now, I know it sounds, you know, crazy. I have heard it all before. I'm not asking you to believe in me. I'm just asking you to sit in this room, observe, and tell me what happens. We all nodded in agreement. A couple of okays filled the air. The doctor carried on. All right, this is how it'll work. I'm going to drive up to the control center. It's about five minutes up the mountain. I have a couple of colleagues in there as well. From there, we'll flip the switch in layman's terms. When Dr. Olson began his next sentence, he leaned forwards and his face took on a very stern, angry father quality. Do not leave this room. After I walk out, do not leave. Do not leave until I come back down the mountain. Walk inside this room and tell you that you can leave. I've done this experiment before, but not on humans. I know it works. I know it's safe. I can promise you this is safe. What I cannot promise you is your safety though, if you leave the room. I remember the air shifting to an uneasy feel. 
Are you sure this is safe? What have you tested it on? What's it gonna feel like? A scrawny blonde guy said, who couldn't have been older than 21. The dots continued. I know this is safe. No animals I've used have been affected by this. I've used rats and progressed up to dogs. No bruises, no cuts, no change in behavior. And to be honest with you all, I don't know what you should expect. I'm not sure what this feels like. A tingle, a sting, a pinch, or anything else. This is the first human trial, which is why we need you to pay attention to any sensation you feel. Wait, okay, if we are actually about to time travel, where or when are we traveling to? I asked. You'll be launching three hours into the future. Once activated at the control site, this building will disappear. My team and I will be on standby for three hours, and then the house is back with all of you in it, three hours into the future. A long silence followed. I'm a skeptic of just about anything, but something about Dr. Olsen's tone, his body language, the way he was explaining it, it was hard for me to doubt. He was dead serious. When it was clear there were no more questions, Dr. Olsen looked at his watch, stood up, and cleared his throat. All right then, it's 1.22 p.m. right now, so by the time I make it up to the control site, it should be just around 1.30? Warm up only takes around two minutes, so we'll mark your projected arrival time at half four. Are there any other questions or concerns? No one spoke. Okay, I'll see you all in three hours, or from your perspective, just a couple of minutes. The doctor winked and nodded and closed the door behind him after adding safe travels. The three of us stood from our chairs and watched the doctor drive off. Then we all turned to each other, the tension yet again easing. Well, he sure knows how to make an entrance and an exit, the redhead said. No kidding, the blonde kid answered. Uh, well, nice to meet you, fellow time travelers. We all chuckled a bit, that nervous sort of laughter. My name is Ryan. I'm Clark, I replied, with a handshake to follow. Emma, she said, with a smile that can make any man or woman's head turn. We exchanged pleasantries, talked about our schooling and how we were selected. Emma was the first to ask what we were all thinking. So what's the chance that this is legit? Don't get me wrong, I'd love to be the world's first time traveler, but I feel like this is going to end in a dud, or are we just being pranked? Yeah, Ryan responded. When he was explaining everything, I thought it may be a prank, like this may be an actual experiment from the university, but it's an experiment to see if they can convince people they time-traveled. That's meta, I quipped. Oh guys, look! Em was staring out the large window. The ring that surrounded the building was slowly getting brighter. It looked like a hundred laser pointers were slowly brightening, shining up into the overcast sky. Does this mean we're in the two-minute warm-up? I said, already knowing the answer. I guess so, Emma stated. God, my heart is racing. Mine too. We all stood perfectly still, watching those skinny beams of light growing, brighter, until it was nearly blinding. I turned to look at Emma. Her pupils were the size of a pencil tip, maybe smaller. Her gaze along with Ryan's was locked on the beams. I could see their faces getting more illuminated each second that passed. Second after second, just kept getting brighter, and brighter, and brighter, and brighter, until it was like we were being engulfed by the sun, and in less than a second, it was dark. I chose my words carefully. Less than a second. It was not like turning off a light, it was not like shutting your eyes. It was faster. It was instant. I saw Emma's pupils quickly grow large as the absence of light from outside the window met her retina. The inside of the house was still illuminated thanks to the one lamp in the main room. Outside the window was nothing. Not nighttime, not black, not pitch black, nothing. It almost had a color to it, but one I can't explain. It gave off no light. It was the color that a blind man sees. It was the color of our sleeping nights in between dreams. It was the color of death. It was nothing. We all kind of looked around after a minute of silence, all staring out of the same window into the void of absence. What the fuck is happening? Emma said in a shaky voice. I don't... I began. My heart stopped beating, Ryan said bluntly. Emma raised two fingers out to her neck. I didn't have to. I could feel it. It was one of the first things that I noticed. When I was staring at Emma's pupils as the light reached its crescendo, my heart was racing. And as soon as the light disappeared, so did the rhythmic thumps of my heart. What the fuck is happening? Emma began to panic. This is just part of it, Ryan stated. 
I'm really freaked out. Trust me. Obviously, something is happening. If you believe the Doctor, which I'm starting to, we may be, you know, traveling through time. I actually agreed with him. Yeah, you're right. We just need to pay attention to this so we can explain it back later. Okay, heartbeat stopped. Check. We're still alive. Check. And that... Void. Abyss thing? Check. We turned to the window in unison. I don't like looking at it, Emma said. It's unnatural. It's... I don't know. Not supposed to be. It's not black, but it has no light. I don't think. She wasn't wrong. I'm kind of glad I don't have a heartbeat right now, because I think I'd have a heart attack, I joked. Anxious laughter filled the small space. We finally moved from our spots where we were standing out from the window. It was a relief to move around the room. I'm not sure why. We were quiet for a couple of minutes. Emma was sitting in a chair with her knees tucked up to his chest, occasionally checking her non-existent pulse, or looking at her hands. Ryan leaned against the back wall, staring out the window. I pulled up a chair next to Emma and joined her quiet atmosphere. Our peaceful still was broken with Ryan's words. Clark? Emma? There's something out there. We looked at him, and out the window. What do you mean? Emma asked. Out there. I can see things. Your mind's playing tricks on you. You know, like when you're in a pitch black room, your mind will see lights and shapes and stuff. No, he countered. It's there. Look. Look out there. You can see. I don't know how to describe it. Just, just look. Emma and I both turned our attention once again to the emptiness. It was still. It was quiet. Abnormal. Yet, it felt like it was meant to be there. Like it was at home and we were the intruders. I don't see anything, Emma said. Me either. Ryan continued to stare out, unflinching. Emma and I stayed at the table, fiddling our fingers and nervously finger-tapping. I'm not sure how much time had passed before the silence was broken. All I know is it felt like a long time. Maybe an hour or two? Well, this is taking some time, isn't it, Emma said. Seriously, I feel like we've been here for a couple of hours, I responded. No, Ryan said. Not even a second has passed. Emma and I glanced at each other, and looks of confusion on our faces. What do you mean? Not even a second has passed, he repeated. His gaze was still locked onto the void. Time doesn't pass here. When you look into it. Into it. You see. No time has passed. No time will pass. When you look into it, it all makes sense. Emma and I locked eyes once again. Yet this time was less confusion and more terror. I spoke up. Come on, man, stop messing with us. He did not reply. He did not blink. Days passed, I think. Emma and I sat and we talked a lot. We did not grow hungry, nor tired, nor thirsty. We did not have to use the bathroom. We came to a few realizations. One that there was no temperature in the room. There was an absence of any heat or coolness. Air was non-existent. After roughly 12 hours, or so we estimated, our bodies began not to breathe automatically. We didn't need oxygen. The other realization was about that void. Ryan had been staring off into it for the entirety of our stay, save the first couple of minutes. He's not moved, he's not blinked. Sometimes he mumbles something about time or the universe, but most was gibberish. Emma and I decided that maybe something was in there. We just can't see it. But Ryan can, and it's driving him insane. We decided it's best not to look out into it for too long. After weeks of being stuck into that room, Emma and I were growing increasingly restless. We started arguing about things, and eventually we stopped talking altogether. Sometimes I would hear a sob, trying to be quiet. I spent a lot of my time crying as well. No tears could come out though. Emma and I ignoring each other was halted one day after Ryan simply stated loud and clear, I'm going out. It was the first time Emma and I had even looked at each other in a couple days. It was the first Ryan had spoken coherent words in weeks. He did not look at us when he said it, and for some reason, neither of us protested. Maybe out of boredom, depression, or curiosity, we didn't stop him. He walked over to the glass door and stood for a moment, never taking his eyes off the emptiness. 
He spoke to us, still facing the nothingness. I'm going to learn its secrets, its power. I'll become a god, and it welcomes me. He opened the door. He reached his hand out into the void. It looked like an optical illusion. As soon as he broke through that plane, his hand disappeared. All I could see was wrist, with nothing attached. He brought his arm back inside the room. His hand was missing. There was exposed bone, flesh, and tissue, but he did not bleed. He did not scream. He then walked out into the void, looking like a ghost walking through a wall. Emma and I stared in horror. She ran over to me and we cried for a while. She said seven words to me through thick sobs that chilled me to the bone. The first real sensation I've had since coming here. Are we going to be here forever? Emma and I spent a lot of our time crying. What else was there to do? Imagine it. You're stuck in a room with nothing to do but stack chairs or topple over empty bookcases in frustration. We played all the name games. Invisible tic-tac-toe, tongue twisters, etc. We can't really play I Spy because our options for colours are either white or void-esque. Sometimes we'd try and fall asleep to no avail. We'd just lay there, occasionally together, sometimes apart, eyes closed with no rhythmic rise and fall of our chests, no soft sounds of a heartbeat, just utter silence. I didn't think I'd ever make it out. I'm not sure of the total time I spent in there. It was hard to tell and grew more difficult as time went on. At first it was easy. You could tell a couple of seconds had passed, then minutes grew into hours. But especially after Ryan left, it was difficult. There was no rising sun, there was no moonlit sky with glittering stars. There's no feeling tired, no sleepiness, or no droopy feeling that settled in after a long day. I felt as if my internal clock was reworking itself to be, well, broken. Emma and I were really starting to lose it, but not the same that Ryan lost it. To curve our sad days, we'd play pretend like we were kids. I'm not sure if this was actual depression on our part, or if our minds were just making us do it in return for a flake of sanity. Sometimes one of us would be a waiter and the other would be eating at a fancy restaurant. Sometimes we'd play doctors, one person would have to undress and be examined. In some scenarios, she'd be my wife. I'd come home from a long day at work and she'd have dinner prepared for me. She'd call the kids down and we'd pretend to eat. I'd tell her about my day while sneaking table scraps to our dog. Our favourite scenario was strangers. At least that's what I call it now, looking back. We didn't have a name for it then. I'd be sitting at the table, pretending I was at a bar or a club. She'd walk up and grab a seat. I'd give her a couple of glances and side eyes before telling the bartender I'd buy her a drink. She'd try and contain her glowing smile, and she'd bat her eyelashes at me. Then she'd make her way across the table, across the bar, and to the chair next to mine. I'd ask for a name. We'd slowly go from surface-level conversation into the world of getting to know each other deeper. Childhood memories, fears aspirations, secrets, dreams. Then eventually one of us would break character and we'd laugh. We'd also write plays in our heads for each other to perform them. Or we'd make scripts for TV shows or movies and actually act them out. Mostly improv. Those are the good moments, the secure ones. Those escapes for us were equal to the escapes of regular people in the real world who are watching TV or scrolling through an app so they don't have to face the reality that engulf them. But at some point, Reality always sets in. Our entire world was in that room. I started to forget what my mother's face looked like. I started to forget what my face looked like. One day, or night, or whatever, I looked off into the void. Emma and I treated it like someone would treat a naked homeless man screaming at them. It's best not to look at it for too long, but it's okay to glance or catch in your peripherals. I stared off into it, wondering about its color, its absence. I wondered where we were, physically. Were we somehow in another dimension? Were we being observed? As I stared off, I saw something. I know I did. It was impossible to miss. Like a brushstroke on a blank canvas. It was there. It was something that existed in a vast expanse of nothing. A tree. It was a tree. 
a perfectly symmetrical pine tree. Almost like those abstract ink block tests used for psychiatric evaluations. It was just like that, sitting dead center of my vision. It wasn't like spotting a tree from inside a window from the real world. No, I was there with the tree. I was merely observing it. I felt like an alien from another planet witnessing it. The tree didn't know I was there. I didn't know where it was. Suddenly, a strong, swift, open palm made contact with my cheek, and I heard Emma yell. Snap the fuck out of it, Clark, please. My face stung, but the pain was dulled when I noticed she was crying. What's... what's wrong? Oh, God, you're already back. You're already back, thank God, she said through quivering lips. You were staring out there for fucking days. I couldn't do anything to snap you out of it. Days? Yes, God, I would cover your eyes or shake you, but nothing was working, so... She kept talking, but her voice sounded like it was falling down a well, as my own thoughts took over my attention. Days? I looked outside for ten seconds, twenty tops. There was no way days had gone by. I told her this. What? She said. Are you fucking around? You stood right there, right there, still as a statue, for so fucking long. I was screaming, I was shaking you, I was pleading with you. I swear I'm telling the truth. I grabbed her hands consolingly. All I remember is seeing something out there. Then I don't... I don't know what happened. What did you see? Her crying had subsided, and her sadness was replaced with curiosity. I think it was a tree? A tree. Yeah, well, kind of. It had like a motion to it. Like it was growing. Not from the ground like a normal tree, but it was spreading, I guess? Like when you take the netting off a Christmas tree and all the branches fall out and the tree looks fuller. It was just like that, but constant. Constantly expanding like an optical illusion. She looked at me like I just told her I had cancer. An expression of sympathy tangled with worry. She let out a heavy breath. I was so worried you were going to leave, like he did. Then she grabbed my neck and she kissed me lightly. It wasn't the first time we'd kiss. We had plenty times before. But I don't, I don't know how it started. I can't even remember our first one. But it was long ago. But every so often, we'd just look at each other and kiss. Was it a relationship or just boredom? I knew everything about her, it seemed. But I don't know. I was stuck there with her. What else were we going to do? Would we have gotten along outside in the real world? If this experiment worked, would we be together? I don't know. A lot of time had passed since Emma slapped me to get out of it. We were more quiet than usual, more thoughtful. She brought it up first, interrupting our previous conversation. So hey, let's say we make it out of here, whether that be a million years or a billion or whatever. Well, you know how you were looking out the window and days had passed in a couple of seconds? What if that's the best thing to do? To pass those years? Maybe if we look out, it'll just feel like a couple hours and then boom, we're back to reality. I wondered that too. What if we never snap out of it though? What if we walk out like Ryan did? What if we're stuck here forever, hypnotized? I know, I know, she said. I thought about that, but... But what's our other option, realistically? We can't keep living like this. We can't keep spending every day going through the waves of talking, silence, laughter, and crying. I'm losing my fucking mind, and I know you are too. What's worse, spending a trillion years in this room until you pull your hair out and slowly slip down the insanity slide, or looking at, at that fucking abyss of nothing? And yeah, there's a chance we'll go off our rocker like Ryan and hypothetically walk out that door. But is it worth it? I think so. We'd spent too much time there. I don't know how long, but it felt like multiple lifetimes. If this ended in death, I welcomed it. I knew we had to do it. It was our only option. Okay, we'll barricade the door, I proposed. We'll put the table, the bookshelf, and everything else in front of it. At least it's one line of defense against us leaving. Yeah, it's no guarantee, but I like the idea. And we did just that. The idea that we could be out of here in a couple hours was the only motivation we needed. After the furniture was moved, 
We sat on the floor in the middle of the room. Our legs crossed and we faced each other. I'm so fucking terrified, she said openly. I know, I am too. What if we never see each other again? What if we never see anyone again, ever? What if it's like this? What if this is it? I grabbed her hands and I pulled her closer before replying. No matter what happens, I'm grateful that I had you here with me. I couldn't have been in here alone. This place is hell, but it would have been so much worse without you. She gave me a nod and smiled, and returned the same gesture. We both adjusted our bodies, still in a sitting position, to face the window. I looked to my right and admired Emma's gaze out the window, just as I did when we were transported here. I squeezed her hand. Ready to spend eternity together, she said with a shaky breath, almost laughing. You know it. And with that, we peered off into the nothingness. It's hard to describe what I saw. The first thing I saw was in that vacuum of a void once again. The tree. It moved and breathed and acted like it had before. After a while, I noticed I couldn't see the walls of the room anymore. It was as if I was enveloped in the darkness. It was like I was a lone astronaut, that any planets or stars for guidance. I couldn't feel my ass against the floor, nor Emma's hand gripping mine. In fact, I couldn't really feel anything. It was like I was slowly losing all my senses. That horrifying nothing colour slowly dissipated. The tree did as well. The best way I can describe what came next is by comparing it to something you've all seen. If you close your eyes, you'll still see some light. You see shapes and objects and other things your brain tells you to see. If you stare at a wall, a blank wall, there's almost a movement to it. A static-like sensation. One that you never really notice until you focus on it. That's what came next. Then nothing disappeared. I could see these shapes in the darkness, random patterns, stars, and static filled my vision. I felt like I was falling. The randomness of the shapes took form in my most nostalgic memories. Things I didn't even know that I remembered from the trenches of my mind. I felt this. This itch almost. I swear those moments I didn't have a body. I didn't have eyes. Yet I could see. I felt like someone had moved my still active brain into a jar and kept me alive. That's what I was experiencing. Just my brain, doing its thing. No outputs or inputs. I felt a prickling, but I wasn't sure where I felt it. I existed, but not in a physical sense. I thought I was dead. I hope this is not what being dead is like. And then faster than a light switch, with no sound effect, no transition of any kind, I was back, standing in the room. Sunshine made its way through the overcast sky and immediately flooded into the window. I was not facing the window though. I was facing Emma, with Ryan right behind her. Both of them were looking out the window, just as we were before everything went dark. My focus was on Emma's pupil, just as it was before. It did not change in size. Before I could process what was happening, Ryan screamed louder than I physically thought was possible. I jumped and I started to get back away, but Emma didn't even flinch. Ryan grabbed the lamp from the table, smashed it on the ground, picked up a large piece of glass and pushed it through his chest into his heart. His hands were bleeding and his chest was discharging blood by the pint. He died within a minute. He was smiling the whole time. Emma, still unmoved, kept staring out the window. I was just trying to process my thoughts, which were abundant. Ryan stabbing himself was the least of my concern, to be honest with you. I backed up against the wall, opposite Ryan, and slumped until I hit the floor. I sat in the fetal position, and was praying the doctor would come down the mountain. The experiment had worked. Kind of. The room did disappear, and we reappeared exactly three hours into the future. Dr. Olsen said he installed the window just in case we could see lights or flashes. He did not know about the void. After Ryan's death, the university shut down Project BTAOW33 pretty quickly. But I doubt that's the last the world would ever see of it. 
Dr. Olsen could only hear the events that took place from my perspective. Emma is in a catatonic state. She hasn't spoken a word or made a noise since returning. She's completely unresponsive. There's no sign of her ever getting better. I visited her in the home she lives in now, and I'm never going back. She stares off from the walls, the same rain that Ryan stared into the void. If there is a god out there, I pray she isn't somehow there, in that place. I hope her mind is free or at peace. Why am I not catatonic? Why did I make it out okay? Did I see the same thing that Ryan saw? I'm not sure. I try not to think about it. I've lived, subjectively, longer than anyone will ever have to experience. To suffer. I don't have the guts to kill myself, though I think about it often. I don't really care if I get in trouble with the law by sharing my story. It's therapeutic to share, and like Dr. Olsen said from the beginning, no one will believe me anyway. Day-to-day -day life doesn't really bother me. I don't mind when interacting with people. I like eating food again, or taking a nice hot shower. I like knowing that I can die, that I will die. It's not the walking moments that disturb me, no. It's when I sleep. My dreams are awful, and are almost always in that place. That room. The doctor says it's because that room is where my brain thinks it's spent most of its life. He said that they were lessen as my stimuli from the real world increases. But dreaming isn't the worst part about sleeping. It's the moment between dreams. As I slip away into oblivion, so does my body. So do my senses. My mind is still active, but I'm encompassed by the void, drowning in its emptiness. That colour. That nothing. Every night. It haunts me. I hope to God you never see it. Never realise that it's there. Because when you do, it won't go away.